going to just give a quick little introduction on our featured speaker tonight. We're excited to host Minnesota author and forensic psychologist Frank Weber, who will speak on writing true crime, forensic work, and his latest true crime novel. Frank has profiled cold case homicides for the BCA and has also narrated an investigative show on the Oxygen Channel um, titled Murdered by Morning. Feel free to ask, I actually didn't ask you this. Do you prefer that they ask questions throughout? Or yes, yeah, okay, that's what I just ask. Okay, yep. sounds good, that's what I thought. Um, and he will also be available afterward uh, to sell books if you didn't get a chance to buy one prior to the start of the program. And for any of you brave souls, he has a lie detector machine over here that he's going to show you how it works. So, and that will be filmed too. So, <laughs> typically so, somebody says, "Polygraph my husband." <laughs> so, with that, please join me in welcoming Frank Weber. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm Frank Weber. I'm a forensic psychologist. I'm the guy who gets called in on homicide, sexual assault, domestic abuse cases to go in and do the interviews. Um, and uh, I started working with victims, then I uh, eventually ended up working with offenders. I'm going to talk a little about that journey and about some of my work. If you have questions, feel free to ask. I'm going to try, try to throw some humor in there because no matter what you do, if you're going to survive, you've got to have a sense of humor. And tell me if I'm moving around too much because, yeah, I have a tendency to do that. Whenever I hear someone speak, I always want to know why they're neurotic like they are. So I'm going to tell you that about me right off the bat. Um, and I'll try to make it interesting. I was at a conference um, dealing with sexuality in California, and there was two women at the table in front of me, and one turns the other and said, this guy even makes sex boring. And I was thinking, <laughs> wow. I was going to say, I hope nobody says that about me when I'm speaking. Um, but OK, so I was raised in a Piers, small town farming community, central Minnesota. It's between uh, St. Cloud and Brainerd. Um, do you need a chair? OK, all right, perfect. All right, so um, <laughs> uh, one, uh, one of 10 kids, raised in poverty, but I, we didn't lack. You know, we had loving, hardworking, caring parents. It was really good. Um, I tell people I was, I was raised to be obsessive. My dad's job when he was in the military was to keep track of all the military equipment in the world on three by five cards in a building in Sacramento, California. This is before computers. And so he was very organized and he labeled everything, and I mean everything. I mean, be, I remember being in the bathroom and looking over at the towel bar, which said towel bar on it, <laughs> and uh, thinking like, what else could it possibly be? Do like small people come in here and do chin-ups? Um, but, uh, and of course, so nothing in my house is labeled, and my wife says, you could afford to be a little more like your dad sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it was, it was an interesting, environment to grow up in. So I'm one of 10 kids named in alphabetical order. I am F, the sixth letter of the alphabet. So yes, like I said, everything was very organized. Um, our lives kind of take weird paths that we meander down. And um, it's sort of, when I left high school, I was going to be a math major because people said, you're good at math. That's what you want to do. So I started taking calculus. And I thought, I really don't like this. And uh, if I'm going to do something I don't like, why go to college? I can get a job I don't like anywhere. And uh, so I started taking classes I was interested in and ended up with a social studies teaching licensure and, co and uh, coaching licensure. Um, then my daughter was born my first year of teaching. Her stomach wasn't fully developed, and the school's insurance didn't cover it. And so I was going thousands of dollars in debt every month. So I knew I had to get a different job as soon as the school year ended. So I tested into a job for the state and got a job at Faribault Regional Center working as a behavior analyst. Um, and this is sort of funny, because the guy I met the first week there still reminds me of this. That, uh, so when I first started there, I said, OK, what's the easiest job here for the most money? And he said, clinical psychologist. And I said, that's what I'm going to be. <laughs> and that's what I am. Um, but people who know me know I work plenty hard. So like a lot of people, when I got my clinical psychology degree, I thought I could work with victims, but I didn't really want to work with offenders. And so I got a job in a big mental health clinic. And uh, they had programs for victims and programs for offenders. And I was helping these victims, and they were doing well. And uh, what bugged me is a lot of the offenders didn't show up, and nobody didn't do, it. They didn't do anything about it. There was no consequence. And so I started going to the Department of Corrections and complaining. And finally, I complained enough where they asked me to come in and meet with them. 
And they said, what would you do different? And by the way, I've been teaching college social problems ever since I left teaching, since I was 25 years old, as a, a hobby, a class, a semester or two. And uh, so I'm always telling people there's answers to all our social problems. If you're do, willing to do the work, they don't have to be expensive, but you have to be creative. So they asked me, okay, what would you do different? So I said, I can think of uh, three things right off the top of my head. First of all, I'd have their probation officer or their parole officer right here at the clinic. If you don't show up, you issue a warrant, and they're arrested. They're court ordered to be here. They damn well should be here. The community thinks they're coming, and they're not. Um, number two, I'd make them uh, do couples counseling because a lot of the guys were involved in relationships with women who had no idea the types of offenses they committed, and they should know that, especially if they have children. Number three, I'd make them take a class in healthy relationships. 60% of all sex offenses committed in Minnesota are committed by people who dropped out of high school. So even though the offenses occur in every occupation, they occur way more with a certain part of our population. And that's the same nationally. And then actually the fourth thing, I'd do lie detector tests. And because uh, I want something beyond the therapist's word that this person is really changing. And so they asked me to start a program and uh, I started a program for two small counties, Todd Wadena, and then uh, within a year, the counties around Brainerd asked me to start a program, then the counties around St. Cloud, and then, the co then uh, 10 counties around Marshall, and 10 counties around Mankato, and Rochester, and Alexandria, Wilmore, North Branch, Bemidji, Grand Rapids. Um, and so the program that I started 27 years ago now serves 70 of the 87 counties in Minnesota. Um, and what's interesting about this, I'm a fanatic about accountability. That, first of all, I didn't want to be big. I've never gone out and, and promoted. I've had counties come to me and say, hey, you gotta develop a program for us because they know we have success. And so every year I ask the Department of Corrections to send me data on the people who are graduating from our program because I don't wanna do something if it doesn't work. And at the present time in 27 years, 97% of the individuals who have graduated from our program have never been convicted of an offense again. But we're intense. And as a matter of fact, we're not in the Metro because the Metro programs think we're too intense. They don't like us you know, doing the lie detector tests and all that stuff. But I just think, would you rather have a program that really works or just keep doing what you've been doing forever? Um, and whatever, they can do whatever they want. So I believe in accountability. What's interesting about this is we're the only program in the state that turns in that data to the Department of Corrections. And I give them grief all the time about this. I say, all the data that you collect what you don't collect is the one piece of data that's significant. Does the program work? That you should know that. That should be community information for every program in the state. And, uh, but anyway, that's my own belief on it. All right. So he started doing this work. And uh, um, you, you need an outlet. You know that because... You, <laughs> you know, when you spend your day talking to a serial rapist, you can't come home to your wife and kids and say, hey, guess what I did today? Yeah. You know, that you traumatize everybody in the family. <laughs> and so, what, what I, so I started, just started writing true crime murder mysteries, putting them in a three ring binder and putting them in the closet. And then uh, in 2016, I decided I'm gonna maybe try to get one published. And so I had a great case. I, had a, I worked with an uh, investigator for the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension named Dick Plopnik. And, uh, he also did uh, lie detector tests or polygraph exams for them. And he was telling me about this case that happened in uh, northwestern Minnesota where a 13-year-old girl was walking down the street. And so it's a small town. All the community is frantic. They're trying to get information. They finally find an older couple who met her. She was walking down a gravel road home, which she did all the time. And they met her walking the other way. And they said shortly after she walked by, we saw this truck come barreling down the road. And uh, they had a pretty good description of the truck. And so they got out the list of registered sex offenders. They found one that had a truck like that. They hauled him in. Here he'd been drinking, which is a violation of his parole. And he admitted that he drove down that road. And so the community wanted to hang him. He said, I never saw that girl. And uh, so what happens is they bring in Dick Plopnik to give him a lie detector test. And he passes it says, I didn't see the girl. And then everybody says, well, lie detector tests don't work. They still want to hang them. 
um, ultimately, he never did see that girl. Sometimes you hear in investigative shows where investigators say, I don't believe in coincidence. Well, I believe in coincidence. I don't like coincidence. I, I, I need to, something to work me through it, but it happens. Um, I was just looking at a, a serial killer case in, in uh, California where his second victim was set to testify against a gang member who she had witnessed um, murder somebody. And so the week before the trial, she gets murdered. So they're ringing out the gang, trying to figure out who killed her. Ultimately, the gang had nothing to do with her. It just happened that a serial killer moving through the area killed her, had nothing to do with the trial. And sometimes that happens. So you, you need to follow logic, but you also need to follow the evidence. And you gotta be careful because you have situations that occur. Um, so the investigator gets sent to, to take a look at the area because it's an area where he was raised, reopens the case when he was in high school. Um, the girl he was dating disappeared. And I'll tell you that, that my books are very much from personal experience. Uh, when I was in high school, um, between my junior and senior year, I was dating a girl that summer and I broke up with her, and after I broke up with her, she disappeared. And uh, this has a good ending, by the way. But, uh, um, but for months, it was just weird, you know, that, because uh, she lived in Little Falls, I lived in Piers, two different high schools, and uh, I had actually been invited to a party in Little Falls by a girl I know. She left shortly after I got there, and I didn't know anybody. She didn't seem to know a lot of people. We got talking, agreed to go on a couple dates. Um, and then school started. And I was a quarterback in football. I was big into music and academics. And I was just busy. And so I just talked to her and I said, look, I'm sorry. This is a terrible time for me to be in a relationship. I'm just too busy. And I just think it's not respectful if you don't have time for another person to pretend like we're in a relationship, which is OK, I understand. So she calls me a week later and said, let's talk about this. So I go and talk to her about it again. Nothing changes. A week later, she calls me again and says, I just think we should talk about this one more time. And so finally I said, okay, this has to be painful for you. We've gone out five times, we broke up three times. That uh, uh, I said, we just need to stop talking to each other because that it doesn't change. And I said, you're a nicer person than I am. That's it's not the issue, I just don't have time. And uh, um, okay, and so a couple weeks go by and uh, we're not talking and uh, um, I asked a friend of mine from Little Falls, and I said, hey, how's she doing? She said, well, she's not in school. And I said, well, where is she? Well, nobody knows where she is. <laughs> they said, what do you mean nobody knows? And so I call her, and these are landline days, no answer. And so I drive in Little Falls, go to where her family lived. It was like a Stephen King movie, just an empty house, nothing there. And I'm thinking, what the hell? And so I go to the neighbors, and they said, they're just, they were just gone one day. They, and they had moved into the community relatively quickly, and they were gone. And so months go by and you know, people say, well, hey, what happened to that girl you were dating? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I don't know. And uh, I had a friend of mine and, and I had kind of some rougher friends growing up. If I was talking to a girl after that, he'd say, you know, the last girl he dated disappeared and nobody knows where she is. <laughs> um, but uh, so Christmas, they used to have rock dances in Little Falls. So I go in and uh, I'm sitting there and all of a sudden she comes walking in and says, hey, you want to dance? And I said, sure. I said, you want to talk? She says, no, just dance. So we dance. <laughs> and, uh, and then I said, OK, you want to talk? And she says, let's dance two more. So we dance two more. And she says, I got to go now. I got a, a friend, friends waiting for me. And I said, I'll walk you out. So I walk her out. And it's you know, this time of year. It's uh, snowing outside. Carload of girls pulls up. She opens the door, turns to me and says, I hate you. Gets in the car, slams the door. <laughs> car drives away. And I start thinking to myself, wow, that couldn't have gone worse. And uh, I thought, well, okay, hell with it, I'm going home. So I get in my car and make the 13-mile drive home. And as I'm driving home, I'm thinking, actually, it could have gone worse. The worst thing she could have said would be, I love you, then I had to break up with her for the fourth time in a row. <laughs> um, but you look back at it, it was just stupid teen stuff, you know, that she's a wonderful person and just, you know, how teens get into this weird drama. Um, but... It, it really made, it messed with my mind for a bit, because you're thinking about this. Well, I hope she didn't kill herself. And I ultimately found out that 
after I said we shouldn't talk anymore, her dad comes home that night, was offered a job in northern Minnesota, but they had to move right now. And so they just packed up and left, and she thought, well, hell with it. If he doesn't want to talk, I'm not going to talk to him. And uh, um, yeah, and so that ended up being good. So I started out this book with the investigator's girlfriend disappears in high school, except she doesn't reappear. And uh, so that motivates him to be an investigator. And then everything about this case, where he's investigating the disappearance of this girl, is accurate to the case. And it's an interesting story. He reopens the disappearance of his girlfriend, and it ended up working very well together. Um, so it was funny, because I sent that to a publisher. And they said, well, who's your target audience? And I said, well, me. I wrote to Vent. And uh, <laughs> they just started laughing. And they said, this is going to sell. You should start on a sequel. And so it took off from there. Um, so I had to come up with my second book. And by the way, I have fun with this book. So none of these people on my book covers are professional models. They're all just people I know who look like the people in the story. This is Jenny Branny. She's a child protection worker in Benton County. Um, and uh, I went out to, there's a scene in the beginning where there's two teens out parking. So I went out to that road. And when I got out there, I just liked the fact that one of the telephone um, poles looks like a cross. And so I took that picture in my rear view mirror. Objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. I think that's pretty cool. And so like I said, I have fun with it and uh, enjoy it. And by the way, maybe I should share this with you. So, one of the things I didn't realize is when you, you get picked up by a national publisher, which I was lucky to do at the time, because at the time you needed to have a national publisher in order to be in Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all that stuff. Um, so I sent them my book. And uh, so they send me this picture of a lake and a forest. And they say, here's your book cover. And I said, well, I don't like that. And they said, well, it doesn't really make any difference because we pick it. That uh, it's ultimately our choice. And so I started complaining more. And I, I, they said, well, what do you want? And I said, I, I want a young woman waiting for a ride. And uh, they said, send us a picture. And I said, well, I don't have the picture. It's just a thought in my head. And they said, OK, we'll go with our cover. And I said, I'll send you the picture. <laughs> so I had a photographer take this picture. And I sent it to him. And they said, well, we still like our cover better. And I thought, oh, this burns me. That, because, uh, and <laughs> they're saying, OK, you've never been published before. And you're telling us how to do our job. And I just said, I'm a psychologist. I know how people think. you know. And uh, I said, OK, I understand you have the final say, but let's do this before we commit to the cover. Let's go to a large book club in Minneapolis, because I need to get proved wrong about this. And uh, we'll set my cover on the table. We'll set your cover on the table. We'll ask every member to walk in and pick up one, the one they pick up at a bookstore and walk out with it. Every person had that cover. And they said, OK, you get your covers. Um, and this is why, when we always say you don't judge a book by its cover, we always judge a book by its cover. You go into a bookstore, you don't pick up every book. You look around, and a cover catches your eye. And if I can't get anybody to pick up that book and read the back, I can't sell it, no matter how good it is. And so the cover was a big issue for me. Um, so my next book, I, got, I uh, got thinking about this, and there was a, a Case, and this is the only book that I've written that's not based on a Minnesota murder. Um, even though it's called the I-94 Murders, it was actually based on an I-680 killer in California. Um, and what bugged me about the case is the case wasn't solved at the time. And I felt that it wasn't solved because the profile was wrong. That the profiler said that this is somebody who's in real estate. And I thought, I don't think this person's in real estate. I think this is someone who knows a little about law enforcement, but has probably worked a rather mundane job most of his life. Um, that uh, here's my profile, a misogynist, someone who hated women, uh, had childhood trauma, neglectful mother, absent father, single during most of his crimes, uh, had a mundane job, and probably had a small penis. And my editor looked at this and said, what is wrong with you? <laughs> and uh, I said, when you work enough investigations, you get an understanding of, of profiles. And when there's a lot of overcompensation in a crime, where things are over the top, it's often a small penis issue. And uh, in this case, you had an individual who broke into homes, tied women up, sexually assaulted them, and then stayed there, made himself something to eat. He'd call them back a couple days later after the assault. He was sending investigators messages. 
about taunting, about not being able to catch him, a lot of overcompensation. So four months after my book is published, it gets solved. And my profile was exactly right. What they found out that uh, he had worked for about a year as a police officer, was fired, and then worked for 26 years in a grocery store. That he was single during most of his crimes. When he was seven years old, he had witnessed his sister being raped by two adult men. Um, neglectful mother. His dad was almost worse than an absent father. So dad left the family, started a new family, and named all the kids in the next family the same names as the kids in his first family. It's like, OK, who is that terrible? It's ridiculous. Um, and uh, they also found out he had a small penis. <laughs> um, and also, I came up with a creative way of solving this um, using DNA, which is ultimately how it was solved. The other thing that I, I wanted to bring up in this is um, serial killers don't start out as serial killers. That there's other types of crimes that they start out with. So I give you a little bit of that introduction. Um, for example, um, the Boston Strangler that uh, I was reading through his uh, writings. And one of the things he had written initially, the first time he had attacked and strangled a woman, he saw his reflection in the window. And he let go of her. And he thought, I'm not going to be that guy. And ultimately, he was. Because what happens is, is they have this terrible thinking. And it just keeps getting worse if they don't do something significant. And he didn't and ended up doing that. The other thing, all my books include actual Minnesota places. And uh, so by the way, I love this community. So I, may be, I, I will be back here this summer for sure. I was just thinking the first time I've been to Lake City, what a beautiful city. So I need to think about this if I want to stage a book here. Um, but the, uh, the places in my book are real places. So this one starts out with a, a conversation a couple girls are having in Buckman, Minnesota. And uh, one of the things I thought was so funny about this community is they have a gas station there where not only can you get gas and liquor, but you can get a tan and a haircut. It's like, OK, who pulls into a gas station and thinks, oh, maybe I'll get my haircut while I'm filling this up. You know, it just, it's a bizarre combination. And so I like including some of those weird, real things about Minnesota. The other thing is maybe it's the teacher in me, but I also like to include a little bit of history about the communities that uh, are addressed in the books. Um, last call. Uh, this is about a 19-year-old um, who was kidnapped after leaving a gas station. What's interesting is there are a lot of similarities to the Jamie Kloss case, but this case actually happened in northern Minnesota and was published three months before Jamie Kloss was abducted. But uh, uh, what I wanted to do, because I've, kid I've counseled kidnapping victims, and so I write from first person. Some of the chapters are from the investigator's perspective. Some are from the victim's perspective, because I know how kidnapped victims change their way of thinking over time. And uh, some are from the offender's perspective, because I also know how offenders rationalize behavior and how they think. Like one of the things I mentioned in this book, that even killers are heroes in their own stories that they found a way to rationalize it and justify it. Um, and this is one of my favorite pictures I took in a river. Um, this is actually uh, Lise Yates. She works in a, a pellet packing plant. Um, and it's fun when you get people who just, they, they love being part of it. Their families are excited about it. But I just love that we, we took this picture in a river and got a full reflection in it. Um, this is my car before I hit a deer with it. Um, and it's interesting. You don't think about things until you get out and take pictures. Like Initially, I was going to have her leaning into the car talking, but I didn't realize how big your rearview mirror is. And I said, OK, you've got to step back from the car. And then she was too high. And then she suggested, well, why don't I take my heels off? Because at last call, it's not uncommon for women to not be wearing heels anymore and hold them. And I thought that was great. It ended up working out perfect. Um, yeah, and one of the things, there's, there's a reference to a couple racial issues in here. So I sent this to an African-American book reviewer in Houston, Texas, and asked her to read it and give me her opinion on it. There's um, a shocker about two-thirds of the way through the book. And she uh, told me, she says, when I got to that point, I was so mad at you that I thought, I wish I wouldn't have promised to read this stupid book. <laughs> and I just said, finish it. And she finished it. And she said, this is one of the best mysteries I've ever read. And, uh, um, she loved the way it worked out, and she wrote and she gave me a quote for the bottom that he might be one of the next great suspense novelists. So, but yeah. 
So that ended up working out well. Um, lying close. This is a, so the investigator in this case was sent to rural Minnesota to, inve to investigate a hunting accident. And then he finds out that there was a teenage runaway that disappeared fairly close. There was a home break in. And as he gets there looking at the case, realizes that they're all symptoms of a larger problem in the area. And uh, um, the reason it's called lying close is because some, someone close to the investigation is leaking information and uh, making it difficult to solve. Um, where is that poster? She is actually, this is uh, the same person who's on last call, Elise. She's my Serena character in the book. But I, we actually hooked her up to a lie detector test while this picture was taken. So you can see, we'll talk about this in a little bit. She's got the breathing tubes on, which go here and here. She's got the blood pressure cup on. And then she's got these things on her finger which measure sweat. And this is what it looks like. That it's, so it's running as we, we shot that cover shot. Um, I put, Dick Plotnick gave me one of the old school polygraph machines, so I have that there if you want to come up and look at it. All of the measuring things are the same. But, and what's funny is in a lot of the shows and movies, you see that ink going across the paper? They haven't done that for 50 years. <laughs> that it's all laptops, you know, that, uh, and so that's what we're going to be using. We're going to be hooking somebody up and seeing if somebody killed anybody in here. No, I'm just kidding. Um, we'll do something that doesn't result in another homicide. Um, and then my newest book. This has been a blast to write. So I had an investigator come to me with evidence boxes and say, I read your first three books. I love them. I've got a great murder mystery. You're the perfect person to write it. And so this is based on an actual case, a psychopath who lived in St. Cloud. Um, and so what it's about is a college student um, from Bemidji State University, after her mother dies, decides she wants to find out who her biological father was. She was raised by a great mother and stepfather, and, uh, um, but just out of curiosity wanted to know. Her mom made her promise she would never look for him. And so she hires all of my books have John Fed Frederick which is my own weird personality as the investigator in it. Um, and so he starts taking a look into this and then finds out that, you know, most people are kind of excited if you don't know your father's, wonder what he could be, that most people don't think about that this person is a psychopath who does horrible things, and uh, which was the case. It was a guy referred to in this book as Billy Blaze. Um, and it's his actual true criminal history. I went, read through this stuff and I just thought, this is unbelievable, it's a relationship stuff. And I have way more than you'd find in any police investigation because they had an undercover DEA officer investigating him. And so all kinds of personal notes about him were in there, like situations where he went into drug parties and robbed everybody at gunpoint where no charges were pressed because nobody's gonna call the police, you know, if everybody's using drugs, that uh, things like that. Uh, um, and just obnoxious, and it's amazing when you read through this that this person didn't, wasn't in prison for long periods of time, but a lot of times people wouldn't press charges because they were afraid of him. Um, but just obnoxious in every, and let me give you just a couple examples of weirdly obnoxious. He'd go through a drive through he drove this, he's a big strong guy, drove a convertible Corvette, he'd come into a drive through and if he wasn't getting his food fast enough, he'd stand in the car and yell in, put his head in and yell in through the drive through window. At one point, there was a couple behind him and say, hey, just leave him alone, they're just teenagers. So he turns him, drops his pants and underwear and yells obscenities at him, this kind of stuff. Just, you think about who does that? Um, even when he went to the dentist, I was reading through there, that the dentist talked about he left and they realized that the CD was missing from the CD player and there was pot missing from the fridge. Like who robs their dentist when you go to the dentist? <laughs> But every place he went, it was just obnoxious. And uh, intense stuff, one of the things, there was a recording of an assault in there. And uh, so chapter four is his whole criminal history. And it's a little long, but I wanted to give you an idea of what this person was really like. Um, what's interesting about this murder investigation, so he goes through this whole history of this crazy behavior. And, uh, and then he said, he gets to 2017 and says, well, that's it. And she says, what do you mean that's it? And says, nobody's heard from him or seen him since. And uh, so 
and this is what's interesting about looking at this file, is when you read through the file, every person they interviewed, and they say, and well, I'll explain this. So ultimately they find, because this is early in the book, um, they find his body in Bemidji State Forest. And uh, um, every person they've interviewed, they say, Billy Blaze is dead. Do you have any information on this? Every person says, thank God. It didn't happen soon enough. Can we buy the person a gift? Every, every interview, one after another. And so it's a weird investigation, because in most investigations, you're trying to create a list of suspects. This one starts out, you have 20 people who wanted to kill him. The question is, who did? You know? And so it's, a, it's an interesting situation. And uh, yeah. So um, this picture was actually taken on uh, the railroad trestle in Little Falls over the Mississippi River. And what you can't see in that picture, this is Chloe Kapsner. She farms um, three miles east of Piers, is that she's actually 20 feet above the Mississippi River. And so I was out there with her and her mom because she looked like the person in this story. And uh, Chloe says, where, where would the best picture be? And I said, well, the best picture would be right in the middle of the bridge, but I wouldn't go out there because <laughs> this is where the train goes over. She crawled down, way down to the bottom trestle. And uh, her mom says, ah, she's a good swimmer. <laughs> and I said, OK, it's a big river. And then uh, again, this is the Serena character. We went on the other side of the dam and took this picture. Because I like playing around with this stuff. If you take a smoke bomb, and, and uh, there's some you can hold, you hold them straight down and you lift them up to here, it makes a perfect heart on a still day. This is one thing I didn't think about. So it's a perfectly still day. We're there taking the picture. But because it's the dam, there's enough of a breeze blowing through there with the water that it wouldn't sit still. But I love the picture anyway, so I used it for the back of the book. Um, in Lying Close, I didn't talk about this, but I addressed the history of African Americans in uh, St. Cloud. A lot of people don't know this, but the first mayor was a slave owner in St. Cloud. And eventually, the only governor from St. Cloud was on the opposite side, was an abolitionist. And uh, just to get a little bit of that history and of the people who live there now. Um, and this book, Burning Bridges, takes a little bit of a look at uh, the Native American boarding schools and has some information related to that. OK. Oh, so this is my newest book that uh, it, it's, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. So Black and Blue, I was done in December. You sent it to the publisher. Um, there's a shortage of white paper. There's a shortage of workers in print shops. And so we've been seeing when I can get this printed. I might have found a company that can get this printed in the next couple months. So. We'll see, but it's, a, it's based on an, an act, a true ca case again where a fiance of a white officer was killed. An African-American man was convicted of it. Um, and uh, the, the police officer, a few years later, gets uh, convicted of a violent rape and he goes to prison. And so you have the African-American is not a nice guy either. His DNA was uh, traced to a number of violent rapes. You have two solid suspects, two terrible men, but only one of them is guilty. And so it also looks at modern day Minneapolis and the problems. And I actually worked with uh, African American and white uh, officers in Minneapolis as I developed this book to make sure everything was accurate. All right. And that's taken on the, uh, what's that now? I can't, the name escapes me, the bridge. Um, Stone Ark. Very good. Thank you, sir, for helping me out with that. Whoops. The other thing, getting into a little forensics, is uh, the way a crime is committed tells you something about the person who committed the crime. If I look at a crime scene and it's cleaned up, right away I know whoever killed that person knew them well. Strangers don't clean up crime scenes. And so you, have, you get information right off the bat. Why did it happen this time of day? Why did it happen in this place? Why was the body brought here? You know, that there's a lot to think about when you start looking at an investigation. And uh, like I said, if you were, I don't believe in psychics. I, I, uh, the only case where, that a psychic has solved is when the psychic confessed because they had killed somebody. <laughs> um, but uh, I do believe in profiling, that there's enough people, when you work a lot in this field, you get an understanding of what type, how, how people commit crimes. Um, okay. 
What's the primary reason people kill other people? Narcissistic injury. Um, in Greek mythology, Narcissus was someone who fell in love with his reflection in the pond, and he became so enamored with it that his reflection, he drowned in it. So a narcissistic personality is someone who is very, very self-centered. So what happens in these cases where someone thinks they're better than everybody else is uh, somebody insults them. They cheat on them. They're, they're not home when this person demands their home or they want to break up with them or they insulted them or fired them or whatever it might be. And it's overwhelming for that narcissistic person. And their anger gets into rage and they commit a murder. Male or female, that's the primary reason people kill other people. Other factors, substance use, alcohol or drug use increases the risk of violence seven times. Mental illness increases it three times. But the, big, the biggest factor is people drinking or using drugs with regard to violence. Um, I have to share this with you. Like I said, you need a sense of humor. Um, I did an assessment on a level three sex offender and I gave him a diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder. And uh, he, can't, he was mad about that. So he comes in and he was talking to me about this and he says, Frank, I know you think I'm narcissistic, but I've just never been in a room before where I wasn't the smartest and best looking person. <laughs> and uh, I'm thinking, nailed that diagnosis. And, and he's thinking, this is just the reality of my life. I'm just better than people, you know? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's go. I'm going to share a little more humor and then we'll get back to the, let's get to the lie detector test. Okay. So I shared the story about narcissists. Um, the brother to the investigator in my stories is someone with schizophrenia. And I have people come up to me and they talk about, they love the way they normalize mental illness and talk about how it really is. But uh, I grew up with a brother with a disability. I know what it's like to protect him from being bullying and what people say. And, and just that odd thinking with schizophrenia, you can have what seems like a normal conversation and it just takes this weird twist. I'll give you some examples. Walking into the office one morning and there's a schizophrenic individual standing outside. I said, hey, how are you doing? He goes, ah, oh, hangs his head. I said, what? He said, last night, I was trying to think of questions people might ask me today. I had that one written down, how are you doing? Then I thought, Nah, nobody's going to ask me that, so I crossed it out, so I don't have an answer. Um, and I wish I wouldn't have been in a hurry. I'd love to see the questions he did have answers for. Um, and, uh, oh, this is, <laughs> I have to put this in a Dick Plopnik. Um, so he was the first investigator I worked with, and he was like one of your old Clint Eastwood type of investigators, just hardcore. And uh, so I had him doing some lie detector tests for me and one day he was in the office and the guy had failed it, obviously lying. And the guy says, the only reason I failed it is because it's so hot in here. And Dick turns some real casually, well, imagine what it's gonna be like for you when you get to hell. <laughs> <laughs> um, another thing that uh, a lot of people with mental illness use cliches or have their versions of them that are always just weird or incorrect. And uh, I was talking to this schizophrenic individual and he was saying, hey, have you heard the saying you can lead a horse to water but you can't make him drink? And I said, I have. And he said, that's exactly what my life is like, but there's no horse. And I said, okay, is there water? No. <laughs> I was say, that's a great analogy. Other than that, um, and the last one I just have to share before we get over to the lie detector test is, uh, like I said, you need a sense of humor. So they did a sting operation in St. Cloud at one of the hotels, arrested a bunch of sex workers. They have a great prosecutor, Janelle Kendall, Becky Bales, great correction supervisor. So after the sting is done, they get together and they say, okay, we got all these sex workers in jail. What are we going to do with them? And they said, well, let's send them over to Frank. He can do psych assessments on them and tell us which ones need drug treatment, which ones need mental health counseling. So I'm going through my voicemail at the end of the day and I have a message on my voicemail. Frank, this is Becky over in Corrections. I was wondering if you'd be interested in seeing a prostitute. And uh, I thought, okay, I get weird messages. And uh, um, so I call her back and I get her voicemail and I thought, I'm gonna have a little fun with this. And I said, wow, I didn't know, know it was so obvious. And uh, I said, I tell you what, I'm gonna try to be nicer to my wife and see how that works out for me. But I really appreciate your concern. And uh, she said she laughed for an hour after she got that message. But uh, like I said, that uh, anybody on the outside would think, what's wrong with these people? I'm going to ask somebody here to write a number one through five on a piece of paper. And uh, one, two, three, four, or five. We're going to hook somebody up to the machine. 
and I'm going to ask them, is it one, is it two, is it three, and I want them to say no to every one. And just by looking at that profile, we should be able to figure out what the number is. First of all, I need a volunteer. Okay, two volunteers, who doesn't, well, who doesn't mind being filmed on it? <laughs> okay, you're on. So these are called pneumo tubes. Okay. Okay, so one goes here and one goes here. Okay. And so this is how you're gonna rip, this goes in the front, yep. and then you just hook it through one okay. of these balls here. Does it need to be kind of tight? Um, not real tight, but I'll tell you, we'll, we'll see in a second. Oh yeah, sorry, you're, lift your arms straight up, yep. Okay. And so what you're gonna see in the pneumo tubes is the green, and there should be some movement. Don't make it too tight, because it, otherwise it, it's too hard to read. Can you spin that so everybody can see the screen? Um, is that possible? Sure, let me think about this. Let me, I know what I'm gonna try to do. Just happened to have an extra chair on me. Um, okay. So let's we'll slide this out of here. Hopefully, let's see how far this can reach. All right. Is that better? Thank you. You're welcome. And next thing. Okay, we're getting good readings. Right handed. We'll put these on your left hand, maybe. Yeah, that is your left hand. <laughs> These two fingers. So we do it. Is the yellow starting to move? So this is measuring sweat. Okay. So the big thing is we don't want that to flat line. Okay, that's getting better. And then we're going to do blood pressure. Wardrobe malfunction, there it is. Okay. What is your first name? Erica. Erica. Okay, Erica, we'll put your arm through here. Actually, let me pull this through. I may have you, if you don't mind, sitting there and pump this. So. And I guess you kind of have to, so just to keep, pump it. Is it tightening? Yes. Yeah. Okay, keep going. Keep going. Hmm, let me look at something. Okay, so about every five seconds or so, pump it. All right, so now let's get a piece of paper. So who wants to write the number down? One, two, three, four, or five. Okay, so write it on the back of this, and then go up and show it to her, but don't show it to me. So it has to be one, two, three, four, or five. When I actually have uh, polygraph examiners, we do one to 10, but it takes a while to do this, so I don't want to spend all night looking at it. Um, okay. So, Erica, where, uh, what city do you live in? Okay. So I'm going to ask you, is your name Erica? You say yes. I'm going to ask, do you live in Lake City? You say yes. And then I'm going to ask you every number, and you say no, okay? Okay. So we're trying to get a baseline. Is your name Erica? Yes. Do you live in Lake City? Okay, 
I'm just thinking about this. So try to, let's try to look here at the gray. Try not to look at her. Sorry. When they usually do this, that they're looking at a blank wall. We'll start again. Is your name Erica? Yes. Do you live in Lake City? Yes. Was the number one? No. Was the number two? Was the number three? No. Was the number four? No. Was the number five? No. Was the number one? No. What was it? Five or four. 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 Okay, yeah, that was, you're a good liar. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, this is actually four, four right here. Um, but this, it broke at one, and that's why I was thinking, ah, I wonder if it's got to be one. But one of the things is, when, you, when you're doing this, that, uh, and you can take that off, and if you want to help her take it off, that uh, when they actually do a real polygraph exam, they ask every question three times. And so they take their time, they slowly go through it, so you have a clear profile of what all of those levels look like. And, uh, and so when you actually start a question and they lie on it, you really see the break and you see it every time in the same spot as they go through each question. Um, sometimes people say, but I'm anxious. I would never pass a polygraph. That's, they love that. that it, it's easier to read if you're anxious. And so one of the things polygraph examiners try to do is they, make you, they try to make people anxious before they start the test because it's easier to read when they're lying. Um, um, sorry, I've actually been, was right the last four times I've done this during presentations, but uh, um, I'm, I'm about, to, to be honest with you, I get it about 75% of the time. The examiners who work for me get it 95% of the time. So that they're definitely better at this than I am. Um, I'm going to shut this off because it gets noisy. Okay. Um, do they work? They work over 90% of the time. You can't use them in court because they're not at 100%. And uh, I'm okay with that because I want to use them in treatment. And what's funny about this is a lot of times I think you could just have a battery and a light because I have guys denying offenses and we say, okay, we're going to do a lie detector test. You bring them in and you sit them down by it and they say, okay, okay, I did it. And, they just, <laughs> and so the majority of the time you actually never hook them up to the machine because they admit the offense as reported. Um, and it is interesting. You do get information. And there's a reason why the FBI and the CIA use them. They work. And poly by the way, this is an interesting thing. So when I went into forensic work, I decided I need to study with the experts. So I went to uh, Toronto and started, studied with uh, Robert Hare, who's the world's expert in psychopaths. I uh, studied at, went to New Orleans, studied with Masters and Johnson in their sexual compulsivity program. And so I, I needed to get that information. But what's interesting is Robert Hare told me, psychopaths don't beat lie detector tests. And he said, here's the classic. He's considered the world's expert on psychopaths. He says, nobody believes me when I say that. And they don't believe me because they've heard it so many times on television and movies that it's like an ingrained fact when it's just simply not true, um, which is interesting because it's a physiological response that occurs too quick to be able to change. That the way we think slightly different, our body functions slightly different when we have to make something up as opposed to a true scenario. Um, and you don't think about this, but lying actually involves some creativity. I mean, you don't, you don't want people to lie, but I worked with one autistic person who couldn't lie because he couldn't imagine a situation that didn't actually happen. And uh, he never, I never thought about it until I worked with him about, okay, that's, you know, that's, it's interesting. And obviously that's not true for most autistic people. Autism is a huge range of various behaviors and abilities. But uh, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about a little more forensic stuff here. Um, okay, let's go back. I like to educate people on some of the new stuff in forensics. Obviously, DNA testing is huge. 
You know, that, that's been such a gift to investigators with solving crimes, and it's got a lot of innocent people off of death row and things of that sort. I always think it's funny when uh, an offender, because if you get a DNA profile, it says the likelihood that this person committed is 99.99999. And then they tell me, well, it's not 100%. And I say, well, that's true, that a man is produ capable of producing 8 million different sperm, and as a, wo a woman is capable of producing 8 million different eggs. So if your parents had 64 trillion children, it's possible that one of those other children could have committed this crime. But being there's only you know, less than eight, people, eight billion people on Earth, it's probably you. <laughs> um, it's, yeah. This is something that I, I talk a little about in uh, Black and Blue because an issue rigor mortis appears approximately two hours after death, um, completes about six to eight hours, and then stays for somewhere between uh, one day and three days. Um, staging of a body. Most people don't realize this, but if a person naturally just falls and, and they've died, they cross their feet. That, uh, for whatever reason, the muscle's tight like that. So if you come across a body and they're laying there with their legs spread, that was a staged body. That person, people don't fall naturally to the ground that way unless it was a, some specific type of accident. Um, this is addressed in uh, Lying Close that uh, we have something called a vacuum metal deposit. So we can get fingerprints off of clothing and sheets and things of that not sort now. And it looks like a big dryer. This person's actually looking into the window. And so what they do is you take, let's say, a sexual assault was committed on a sheet, put the sheet in there, and you melt less than a dollar's worth of gold till it becomes a gas. When gold becomes a gas, it adheres to the oils and fingerprints. And then you take zinc and you melt zinc in there. When zinc becomes a gas, it turns gold black. And then you pull out the shirt or the sheet or whatever it is and you see the fingerprints all over it. Um, well, probably somebody who worked in a factory with gold and zinc, you know? <laughs> and uh, who, because that's where a lot of this stuff comes from. This is another interesting one, electrostatic detection apparatus. Remember in the old detective shows, if there was a sheet ripped off, they'd get the pencil and go over it and see what was read. They don't need to do that anymore. Um, one of the things they discovered is when we write on paper and there's another sheet of paper underneath it, it actually creates an electrical charge. And uh, so they can put this in this machine and read what was written below it. As a matter of fact, they can take a, take a stack of post-its where like, let's say, six notes were written and were torn off and they can tell you what was written on every post-it above it based on different levels of minute levels of indentations in the paper and uh, the electrical charge each one has. Um, and that is an issue in Last Call. We talk a little about that in that investigation. Here's a challenge. How do you get footprints out of snow? You know, you see the movies where it's on a road, they pour the plaster in. You can't pour plaster in snow and have, have it maintained. And so what they do is they take spray beeswax one thin layer after another until it's thick enough and you can pick it up and you got the shoe print. Um, the other thing that's interesting is there's a program called Soulmate, which you can put the shoe print in there and it'll tell you the size and make of any shoe print. Yeah, clever name, whoever came up with that one. Um, more than anything else, cell phones have been useful in investigations. Um, iPhones put you in an area. Android phones, you can trace an, the location of an Android phone to its exact location at any point in history. They've actually used Android phones to prove that someone is at a site where the body was dropped off at the time the body was dropped off. And uh, a lot of people don't know this yet, but I'm, you're going to be one of the first to know that the new iPhones, you can track them even when they're off. And so if someone thinks you shut it off, that you can't track it now, but you actually can't. Um, and the new iPhone just puts you in the area. It doesn't, it's not as exact as the Android. 
Well, right. It's, it's not as exact, but if you, you can track the phone to an exact location. Yeah. You, you can't prove where it was at any point in history, but you can find it right now. Yes. Yeah, you would need a warrant. But if someone disappears, it would be relatively easy to get. Yes? What kind of cell phone do you have? I have an iPhone. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Um, and so the fingerprint system it used to be called AFA. Uh, that's supposed to be an F, not a G. <laughs> Obviously, G doesn't stand for fingerprint. Um, but uh, um, now it's IAFIS, the Integrated Automated Fingerprint System. And so 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, you can put a fingerprint in and, and find out if there's a match in the system. Something else that is, I think is interesting is a dog's nose print is as unique as a human fingerprint. So if someone tried breaking into your house and your dog attacked them, they found that person in a couple hours and they're still wearing the same pants, they could find your dog's nose print on those pants and say it had to be that dog. Um, alias, this is an interesting one. So it's uh, the Automated Linguistic Identification and Assessment System. So, and you see this sometimes if um, it looks like a suicide, but you suspect maybe the person was murdered, there's a suicide note there. This program looks at, they take things the person has written in the past, and based on the way they put together sentences and use adjectives and adverbs, they can determine if the person wrote that suicide note or not. And so it doesn't make any difference if it's, if it's handwritten or if it's on a laptop because of the way they're looking at it. Um, okay. I just talk about, I, I generally go through everybody's history when I'm doing interviews. Let's see. Let's have a, oh, I'm going to share this. What's the most unusual interview and I've ever done? St. Cloud Prison, if you've ever driven by that and see the big black walls on Highway 10, that uh, I've been in the, every prison in the state doing interviews, but this time they kept bringing me downstairs. They bring me into a room that's all gray cement, floor, walls, ceiling, two plastic chairs in the middle of the room, nothing else. In between the chairs, a metal plate bolted into the floor and on it, a chain like you pull a car with. So they said, have a seat. We'll bring in the guy you're going to interview. So I have a seat. They bring this guy in, orange jumpsuit, shackles on his wrists and feet. They sit him across from me. They take that chain and wrap it around his shackles and they put five master locks in it. And they say, okay, are you comfortable interviewing him now? And I said, well, I have the guy on two rape charges, which I typically do that interview. He wouldn't even be handcuffed. And they said, well, he killed a gang member last night. And I said, well, I guess I'm comfortable interviewing him like this. <laughs> and so then we spent the afternoon talking. Um, most unusual question. I got to share this because it's just so bizarre. I was speaking in uh, Stillwater to a large group of people and I got done and I said, anybody have any questions? And this woman said, hey, did you hear about that perv who was in Minneapolis breaking into houses and rubbing women's feet and sucking on their toes? And I said, actually, I am familiar with the case. I can't talk about it. She says, I'd have paid that guy $200. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess he broke into the wrong house. Um, but you get, like I said, we get our humor from weird places. I have five granddaughters, no grandsons. Um, and uh, so my investigator now has a daughter and I just love some of the stuff. Um, so I have one granddaughter who's eight, then uh, three of them are three and then one who's just a few months. But so for five years, that eight year old, when all three of my kids are married, was her and eight adults every Christmas, every holiday. And so she's very comfortable talking with adults, too comfortable. And uh, so my daughter was in California. She's a psychologist. Her husband fixes jet fighters on aircraft carriers. And uh, we're in a restaurant eating with my daughter and her. And she was three at the time. And uh, there's a couple in their 80s who sat in the booth across from us. And you could tell they'd just been arguing. They were red, not talking to each other. And she kept looking over there and looking over there. And finally, she turns and yells at him, hey, the two of you doing OK over there? <laughs> And uh, my daughter says, I wonder where she gets that from. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and so I'd like to use some of that in the book. Uh, in an IQ test, I had the, quest the question is, how are a fish and a submarine alike? This is supposed to be an easy question. Well, they both go in water. This guy was thinking and thinking and said, oh, they're both sandwiches. 
I had to give them credit. They are both sandwiches. <laughs> and uh, this one with a one-year-old um, just starting to talk. It was on, we were in the yard, and she's looking at a bee on a flower, and it flew off. And uh, she says, where'd bee go? And then I said, I don't know. Where do you think it went? She says, probably Target. <laughs> and it's like, that's where everybody goes. Um, the other thing is I like, we all know people who'd be great characters in stories. And uh, so um, the, this, the last call, I had to use this. In the community I grew up in, there's a number of guys named Ray. And so they all kind of get monikers. Like one was called uh, um, Rate, Ray 8 because uh, he didn't go out until after the harvest, the Oktoberfest, and Oct is 8 in German. Um, another one got the unfortunate moniker of Raylo because uh, when uh, Jennifer Lopez changed his name, his name was Ray Lowscheider, they, everybody called him Raylo. And, uh, but my favorite one is a guy we called Ray Ray. And uh, he was a mechanic, always covered in grease all the time, head to foot. Um, and uh, he could, you know, you know people could bullshit kind of a level above everybody else. He was that guy. Um, always in a hurry. And we called him Ray Ray because he always repeated everything he said. He'd walk into a bar, give me a beer, give me a beer, gotta go, gotta go. And uh, if the bartender was busy, he'd look around the bar and find somebody with a tall 16-ounce uh, bottle of beer in front of him. And he'd walk over and say, you know, there's a trick I can do. He said, I can swallow an entire glass of beer in one swallow. And then there'd be this conversation. Well, that's not possible. Nobody can swallow 16 ounces of beer in one swallow. And Ray would say, look, I don't want to take your money. Let's just bet a quarter on it. OK. So Ray would pick up their beer. Start sipping on it and it'd take him, you know, like a dozen swallows to put it down. Finally set the empty glass on the bar and say, I guess you're right. You'd give him a quarter and walk away. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. And then I have a brother-in-law who gets, uses words incorrectly all the time with total confidence. Um, one of my favorite is uh, um, he was telling somebody about all of the drones he has. And I was telling him after the person left, he owns this gas station. And uh, I said, you don't have any drones. And he said, yeah, you know, those little cement guys. <laughs> and uh, I said, OK, those aren't drones. Those are gnomes. Um, but I will end this with this, and then you can ask any questions. Uh, I should wait a second on this. But uh, like I said, one of my favorites is when people use cliches wrong all the time, because they do it all the time when I'm interviewing people. And sometimes you have to think about it. Somebody said, you know, you shouldn't throw stones at people who live in glass houses. And I was thinking, what is that saying? Well, the saying is people who live in glass houses shouldn't cast stones. But you probably shouldn't throw stones at people who live in glass houses either. <laughs> um, but this one that I'll put on in a second is my favorite. We've all heard the saying, work like you don't need the money, dance like nobody's watching. I was doing an assessment on a young woman. She said, yep, my mom always said, dance like you don't need the money. Yeah, so that's one of my favorite things to say if people are going to weddings or things. Dance like you don't need the money. That's a, it's a whole different visual there. All right, any questions? Anybody? If not, I will be back there. Books, 15 bucks a piece, or I give you a better deal if you buy more. Um, thank you so much for coming out. I appreciate you getting on all these people on a cold night in Minnesota, so thank you. I'm hoping to. I don't know.